Terry. Yeah. No, I was just like, I was really confused because I had two identical files saved in the folder and then no questions. Well, it's not, uh, it wasn't in the rubric on that one, but Chris wants to add to the rubric. If, if you do not have your name in the file name, it's like 5% automatically. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll, if, there, if you have questions, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know where Chris is, but we're going to go ahead and get started. He's on his way? Okay. Okay, good deal. So first of all, let's do homework stuff. The thermistor assignment that I handed back, uh, I have some solutions worked up, but this is what your plot should have ended up looking like for that. Hey, Chris. So. There were several issues that a lot of people had on this assignment. Uh, one was you solved for the wrong resistance in the voltage divider. I would say that's the most common uh, hang up that folks had. So if you look at the circuit, we had plus V, our V ref, I think we called it, and then a resistor, and then the variable resistor, that's the thermistor. So, and this was a 10K fixed resistor. So this would be R1. This would be R2, and we know the formula for the voltage divider is V out, Vn, R2 over R1 plus R2. So people ended up solving for R1 instead of R2. And when you did that, you would get something that looks like this except mirrored across the y-axis. This would be a down-going temperature instead of an up-going temperature. So that was a pretty common mistake. Uh, the other, there were some people that didn't use the B-value formula that we had and just assumed a linear response, which you can't do. We talked about how thermistors are nonlinear. So you need to use the, the B value formula. And if this is V out here, then this is R1. And a few people had uh, that problem with the other things. Too. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, so when you're in fact, when you're done with John, you want to show some things. Right. And I, I think that we should check. I'm pretty sure that the bottom resistance is on top in that equation, though. Uh, well, let's see. So if you make R1 uh, near zero, if you make R2 small, then, then, R, then <coughs> both the job will be close to the ground. Right, so if this is yeah, less no than 10K, right. yeah, it, it should be R2 up on top. <coughs> yeah. So any questions on the thermistor homework? Uh, we also said that it should be close to room temperature. So if you didn't get something close to room temperature, there was something wrong. Uh, all right. Then any questions on the calibration assignment that we handed back? I know most people, I don't think anybody did poorly on it. Uh, so if you have any questions, come see me afterwards, I guess, if you don't feel comfortable asking them now. But everybody did a pretty good job on that. And the calibrations were pretty linear. I think we're going to talk about, maybe on Tuesday, the first part of the lecture for five minutes, talk about how to read a vernier. Because 
from the DCDT group, it was obvious that someone did not know how to read a vernier because there was an offset in the data when people got changed out that looked like it was probably a vernier reading error. Somebody did it one way and then somebody read it another way. So we're going to talk about how to read a vernier scale. It'll take about five minutes and it's a useful skill. So Chris, do you want to? Yeah, do you have the Where do you have it? It's in, um, it's in an assignments? No, it's in just the basic uh, slides. slides, I guess, for that week. Uh, follow up. Yeah, so it's just, yeah, follow up. That's what I did. Yeah, it's just two or three things in there um, related to uh, common problems that people had. with the way uh, the signals come out of a potentiometer. And you can find different systems. This is the most common system. Almost all these potentiometers, they have three conductors coming out of them, three contact points. And so you know, one side is connected to, you know, conceptually, if this is what that is, one side is connected here, one side is connected there, and one of these things is connected to the to the variable thing that you're turning. It's not always this way, but usually it's this way. But if you if you then connect from here to here, then no matter what you do to that, it doesn't make any difference, right? You're always just going to get 10K. Or if you, um, well, that's, that's the only thing that you can do to really completely mess it up. Because, but if you connect from here to here, and you didn't end up connecting anything to this, uh, depending upon the way your circuit got set up, you might not, you know, you might not have anything. So, I suppose whenever I work with one of these things, take a, a voltometer or something and just make sure that you're changing the resistance the way you think you are, because if you're, if you're not, you're, you're going to get a nonsense 
nonsense result. Um, so, I don't know. I wrote this down here too because I, I, you know, in my little training rubric that I passed back to you, one of the things I, I checked on myself was that when you calculated these voltages for problem number two, that that you took the voltages and really plugged them back into your equations to make sure it worked. And hardly anybody did. I was kind of surprised. Because when I did it, I thought, well, how, 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 how the hell do I know if I'm right? Even if my theoretical values agree with the values that I measure, maybe I can just be wrong in two different directions somehow. Yeah. 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 And actually, when Chris was talking, I thought of one thing on the calibration assignment that several people did. So when you make a plot of your data, and let's say that we had the load cell. Let's just chunk this so nobody else gets cursed with it. So we've got kilonewtons and millivolts, and you had your data, and you fit a line. It's hopefully a little straighter than that. What are the units of the slope on the line? Right, so millivolts per kilonewton. Several people took that calibration factor, multiplied it by how many millivolts they measured, and successfully created a unit of millivolts squared per kilonewton as an output, which is not at all what you want. So remember, you have to take the reciprocal of that. So you would have kilonewtons per millivolt times millivolts, and that would give you the amount of kilonewtons that you had on your load cell. So that was a pretty common mistake that several people made. All right, if there's nothing else, we're going to go to the wonderful world of operational amplifiers for actually two classes. And if we have some time at the end, hopefully about 10, 15 minutes, we'll go up to the lab, let you keep working on your string gauge activity. And if you have any problems, help you. I know a few people have come and said they had some kind of issue and but several people have working circuits now. And you'll need it for next week. And we'll talk about why today. So we use amplifiers and specifically operational amplifiers in the lab quite a bit. During the calibration activity, I took these pictures right after everybody left. So I've got 10 pounds on the load cell here and no weight on the load cell there. It's hard to see what the meter reads on this credit projector. So we'll go ahead and do the math. The two readings are 124.06 millivolts at 10 pounds and 123.47 millivolts at no pounds, no weight. So that comes out to 0 0.059 millivolts per pound. So that's 59 microvolts per pound. That's really hard to measure well. It would be impossible with your Arduino because on your Arduino, remember you had five volts and 1,023 bins that it could go in because it's a 10-bit A to D. So that was a 5 millivolt per bit resolution, roughly. So you're not even going to see that. Uh, you would see one bit would be 100 pounds on your Arduino with this. If you move the decimal, two spots. So that's not very useful if you want to measure the weight of a person. You can tell them if they're 100 pounds, 200 pounds, or 300 pounds, assuming you have no noise. Uh, isn't very helpful. But if you put an operational amplifier in there and multiply it by 1,000, all of a sudden it becomes something much more useful, like a half a volt per pound. And the thing to remember about amplifiers is they amplify what goes into them. So if you have a noisy signal coming in, you amplify the noise just as much as you amplify the signal. So you need to have a clean signal. We'll talk about that with signal integrity later on. But the name operational amplifiers doesn't, it's not just amplifiers, they're operational amplifiers. And that comes from back during the days of analog computing. So this is a computer that was solving differential equations using nothing but analog electronics. And you'll see that with an operational amplifier, we can make a circuit that takes the derivative, that takes the integral. Uh, we can make all these calculus functions and simple summing and differencing functions with operational amplifiers. So before digital computing, some of the early Apollo uh, like simulators and that kind of thing, they were all done with this technology. And we still do this in some circuits. We obviously don't build analog computers anymore most of the time, but in control applications, we still use operational amplifiers as math engines.
And the nice thing is there's no processing time, right? It's pretty much instantaneous, almost. It's on silicon. So if you look at an operational amplifier on a circuit diagram, it's this triangle with positive and a negative input terminal, which aren't really positive and negative. We call these the non-inverting and the inverting input. And then an output, and then two supply rails, they're called. So you could supply it uh, with, say, plus or minus 15 volts for a 30 volt differential to have a similar setup to what we had during the calibrations. We'll talk a little bit more about the supplies in a second. But it, most of the time when you buy an operational amplifier, let's say you can get multiple amplifiers on one chip. You could get one chip that has four or more on it. Let's say you just have one. It normally comes in a package that has eight pins. And there are a few more things other than just what's on the schematic generally. So there are these two terminals that are offset null that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then there's your inverting and non-inverting input, minus and plus voltage supply. Sometimes you'll see these referred to as uh, VSS and VEE. There's a bunch of different terminology that can go with that. It means different things to different engineers. Uh, the output terminal and then this no connection terminal. Don't connect things to the no connection terminal. If you do, it's pretty random, the behavior that you'll get. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it can totally toast the amplifier. Depends on who made it and how they made it. So op amps are one of those things that I, I was talking to Robert before the class. I said, the first time you see it, it's not going to make any sense. The second time you see it, it's not going to make any sense. And it won't make any sense the third time you see it. But somewhere around the fourth to the tenth time that you see it, something's going to click, and you'll not know how you didn't see it the first three or four times, probably. Seems to be how it goes for a lot of people. It's definitely how it went for me. Uh, but we're going to look at the ideal operational amplifier to start with. Uh, this does not exist. There are lots of gotchas when you work with real amplifiers as with everything, but if we understand the ideal, maybe we can understand uh, real life later. So the first one is, first characteristic of an ideal operational amplifier is infinite open loop voltage gain. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we look at some applications, but the idea is an ideal amplifier, if you give no feedback, if you connect, so we've got a plus and a minus, and we've got out, this is inverting in, this is <coughs> non-inverting in. If you connect signals to there, it will take the difference of them, multiply it by infinity, and put that on the output. And that's not very useful because we don't have infinity volts available to us. But in the ideal world, we're going to say it's an infinite open loop gain. Number two, infinite input impedance. When you connect something to these two inputs, they're going to have a very high impedance on a real amplifier. In the ideal world, we'll say that impedance is infinite. So that means that DC, the resistance is infinite. If the resistance is infinite from Ohm's law, we know that no current is flowing. So what that's going to tell us in the real world is that these are very low current connections. They have a very low bias current, like nanoamp or less. So very, very, very low. And that's useful, as we'll see in some circuits. Uh, zero output impedance, this would mean that whatever you connect to here, you could connect the power supply of the Empire State Building, and assuming things are at the right voltage, it will be able to source or sink an infinite amount of current. That's not the case either. It would melt very quickly, but we're going to assume that you can source or sink an infinite amount of current on the output. Uh, that there is no noise contribution from the amplifier. Meaning if you feed in a pr pristine signal, you're going to get a pristine signal out. You're always going to add a little bit of noise. It's called Johnson noise. It's just a fundamental process. Uh, the output offset, we're going to assume that it's zero. I'll show you what that means in a second. Uh, the basic idea is if you put something on here that produces zero differential, like say one volt and one volt, that you'll get one volt or zero volts out because the difference between those is zero not always going to be strictly the case. And infinite bandwidth, meaning that you could send a signal that's DC, or you could send a signal that's operating at 5 terahertz into this thing, and it's going to perform the same. And that's not true at all. 
in real life. When you hook these up, a lot of times you'll see them powered by what we call bipolar power supply. This is what we used during the calibration lab. Basically, it's two power supplies, two batteries connected like this. We have the positive and negative of these two connected, and we're calling that ground. Ground is not a fundamental, you know, there's earth ground, but ground is what, just some reference point that we define in the circuit. It's some place that we're saying this is going to be ground, this is going to be zero. Now, so up here we have 15 volts above ground, and down here we have 15 volts below ground, so we're providing this with a 30 volt differential supply. You can hook up amplifiers, most, not all operational amplifiers, uh, with the V minus input at ground and then drive it with, say, plus 30 volts in this case. An advantage here, though, is say that we have a signal that could be positive or negative from your, uh, from your DCDT lab the other day. Uh, that could be, well, the people that were in that group, what did you measure, like minus 12 to 13, plus 13 or something like that as outputs? Right. So you could, with this circuit, have the output swing from minus 15 to plus 15, potentially, with this circuit, it's only going to be able to output 0 to 30 volts reference to ground. So you have to do some offsetting. So 0 volts differential would be 15 volts here. That makes sense so far? OK. This is a way you can think of an operational amplifier inside. I want to stress this is not at all what happens inside an operational amplifier, not even close. The data sheets tell you how, but this is this is a way to conceptualize it if you've never looked at them before. You've got the non-inverting non and the inverting input that go into this summing uh, element here. So we're going to add those together, so take whatever's on the plus, subtract whatever's on the minus, they go into here, and we apply some gain factor G. That's the open loop gain. And you could think of that as operating the wiper on a potentiometer that goes between plus V and minus V. So if the gain is infinite, then you're going to have two options. You're going to be all the way to plus or all the way to minus, right? And we can do some feedback to make this a more useful amplifier. But you can sort of think of that's how they work inside. That open loop gain that we assumed was infinite, if you look on a real data sheet, which is going to be a little hard to read here. Let's see. We should have circled it, yeah. So volts per millivolt, large signal voltage gain. So remember, volts per millivolt, we're going to multiply by 3 to get volts per volt. So that's 200,000 is the gain, open loop, of this amplifier, which is a 741. It's a pretty cheap, common amplifier. So 20,000 to 200,000 is a pretty normal range. That's not very useful for most of our applications. If we put in, you know, we saw in the load cell, multiplying by 1,000 does a pretty good job for what we need. 20,000 would be useless. Also be very noisy, probably. But we can use the open loop configuration to build something called a comparator. There are special chips called comparators you can buy. You can also use an op amp as one. Uh, this is a pretty classic circuit. So we're going to analyze this circuit a little bit. All right, so we assume that it's powered by some, let's say, bipolar power supply. Why not? And on the output, we have an LED and a current limiting resistor on that LED. We know how to calculate those now. And we have this input voltage going directly into the inverting input. And we have a voltage divider with a potentiometer uh, going into the non-inverting input. So between plus V and minus V, we can turn our potentiometer and set this voltage here to be anything between plus and minus V. So let's say that we set the input here to be red markers are not our friend today. Let's say we set the input here to be 0 volts, and let's just say we have minus 10 and plus 10 as inputs for the sake of argument. So now we have some voltage coming in. Let's say that we're going to set that to... One volt, could be anything. We're just going to pass some signal in. So what is going to be on the output of this operational amplifier if we have zero volts going into the non-inverting and one volt going into the inverting input? One volt. Close. 
So we're taking what's coming out here is the non-inverting minus the inverting. It's hard to write that in a way that makes sense. So minus one volt is what's going to come out. And if we have minus one volt on this side of the LED, is the LED going to illuminate or not? So the cathode is more positive than the anode. Will it turn on or will it block? It'll block. So the LED won't be on. Now, let's change our analysis. And this is how you have to do with op-amp circuits. You pick a condition and then you look at the case where one's higher than the other, one's lower than the other, when they're the same. It's really the only way to figure out what's going on in most of these. Now let's say we have minus one volt coming in. So now it's going to be on the output. One volt. And now the cathode is higher than the anode and the LED is going to turn on. So what this is doing is if the input is less than whatever we have this set point here, it's turning the LED on. So we could change our set point to be minus 3. Now we have minus 3, minus, minus 1 it's on the output. We would have minus 4 volts, which means the LED is not going to be illuminated, right? So you see we're just comparing two voltages. Or, sorry, minus two. What's wrong? Yes, minus two. LED is still not going to be illuminated. So we're just comparing two voltages, and we can be in either an on or an off state, sort of a one rail or the other state on the output. It's open loop gain, remember, so very, very high gain. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, okay. It's a really useful circuit. One application of this that we semi-often use, I would say, is squaring a signal. Uh, for example, if you are doing some simple analysis of vocal commands for something, a lot of times, or radar uh, returns, a lot of times you would do this where you take the speech or you take the radar return and you produce a square wave out of it because you're just going to do some frequency analysis on it or you're going to do some other operation. You don't care about all the content. You want to get a simplified waveform. Uh, what we're doing here, we have a sine wave coming into the non-inverting input. It's the same, same circuit as we had before. This dashed line represents the voltage that we have set with this potentiometer. So our sine wave is coming up. Once it crosses, once it becomes greater than the value that we set on the potentiometer, the output swings down to minus V. Then the sine wave comes back down. It hits that value. Now it goes below it and our output jumps up to plus V. So we're taking that sine wave and we're squaring it. Same circuit, we just don't have the LED in here and we're putting in a sine wave instead of some fixed voltage. Does that make sense so far? Okay. The amplitude of the blue? Oh, good question. Yeah, no, it doesn't have to be. Uh, so you could put in a smaller sine wave. Let's say you put in one. I'm really bad at drawing sine waves. Let's make one that's the same frequency and same phase, but smaller. It'd do the same thing. It just has to cross that threshold. So you would have here, the transition would be here and here instead. It just so happens that here they've got the input and the output drawn on the same scale. The output voltage, you may think that if we supply it with minus 15 and plus 15, this is going to be plus 15 and minus 15. That's only true for a very specific family of op amps that are called rail to rail op amps. That means their output can go all the way to the supply voltage. Most operational amplifiers that you get off the shelf, the 741, the OP177, all the common ones, uh, are not rail to rail. They have a difference. So let's say we're putting in 15. They might say they can go to within 1.5 or 1.7 volts of the rail. So you might only be getting out 
13 and a half and minus 13 and a half or something like that. So that's another thing to watch out for. You've got to make sure you have enough headroom built in to handle that if you don't have rail to rail amplifiers. This is a pretty classic circuit. Uh, it's a bar graph. You might see these LED bar graphs on different pieces of equipment or like audio levels. And really, the way a lot of these work in a simplified form is they've got a bunch of comparators, one for each LED. It's that circuit that we saw before that we analyzed. But now we have a voltage divider, just a big one, that's providing a reference or a threshold voltage for each of these. And then the input is connected to each of those as well. So everybody see how that might work, right? If you're doing an analysis of this circuit and you want to know what the voltage here is, this is R1, and the sum of all of those is R2. And if you want to know what the voltage here is, the sum of those is R1, the sum of those is R2, and so on. You can build forced MIMS. wrote a great set of books, I would say, in the 80s or 90s. I remember buying them at Radio Shack before Radio Shack went out of business. Uh, and they were, I think they were called Electronics Basics or something, and they had all these little thin books that you could buy that were projects for different areas of electronics. And one of them, he had all of these circuits, he hand drew all of the books with a half a millimeter pencil, like lead on graph paper, and they just photocopied them, basically, and they were really nice looking. Uh, Star Simpson has been doing the Circuit Classics series. You can go to Crowd Supply and buy them, uh, where she makes printed circuit boards that you can solder the parts into. It has the original drawing from the book, and it comes with a nice explanation of how it works. And then you can probe around and figure out how all these things work. So here you can buy uh, this kit right now. It's four LEDs. This is four operational amplifiers in one chip. So that's why here you can't really see this as one out of four, two out of four, three out of four, and so on for each of the amplifiers built into that chip. There's the divider chain. But you'll notice there's a potentiometer at the top, I think. Now we don't have a blow up of that. This potentiometer sets the sensitivity or sets the range of this circuit. It changes the top of the voltage divider, the voltage there. And there's a video online of her working with that. So real quickly, calculate at which voltage each of these LEDs would switch on in this bar graph circuit. So it'll take a couple minutes to do that and then see if everybody agrees. Right, so this is a 1K, this is 10K, 100K, 1 meg, and 10 meg.
if you're solving the equation for the voltage divider, what's the numerator on this part? All right, well, let's start with what's the denominator? That's actually a more useful thing to start with. Right, so that's, yeah. Everybody agree with that? Okay, so what's the numerator on this one? We got five volts out here. Uh, so it's, five. it's what? Four. Yeah. And there's this really nice pattern, right? The denominator is the same on all of them, and then you just reduce the number of ones all the way down, and multiply it by five. So what did people get for the voltage at the top node? Nine 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 five, then I think it's a seven or something after that. Yeah, it's it's a high value. So you get something, or it's four. There we go. You get values like these. People agree with that? Okay, good. I did this about five minutes before this, so glad that it worked out well there. Uh, the idea here is you can make this circuit nonlinear. You can make it very sensitive. Let's say this were some kind of uh, production test jig or test for something on your machine that you needed to make sure that you were within five millivolts of our 50 microvolts of some rail. You could make a very sensitive nonlinear display like this. So people feel comfortable with the comparator and with like a chain voltage divider. It's okay if you don't, but we can go back and review. Okay. So now we're going to do something really weird, and we're going to take the output, and we're going to connect it back to the inverting input, and we're going to put our input signal here. Assume that power and all that, most of the time we don't even draw the power connections on this. We say power's connected. We figure you know how to do that. Any ideas what's going to happen? So let's say that we put... Five volts on the input. Any ideas yet? So what we're going to end up with is five volts on the output. This is called a voltage follower. It's using negative feedback. We take, this is basically a target voltage, right? So we're trying to take this, subtract the output from it, and put that here. So it's always going to end up being the same voltage. It's going to create a follower with no, ideally, no phase change. This would be called a buffer most of the time. You hear it's referred to as a buffer circuit. It has a gain of one. So we put a 10 volt sine wave in, you get a 10 volt sine wave out. And remember we said that the amplifier is always going to add a little bit of noise to the signal. So you might say, why would you ever, ever do this? because all you're going to do is add a tiny bit of noise onto your signal. But you come back to some of the other rules of the ideal amplifier. This has roughly infinite input impedance, hundreds of kilo-ohms, uh, mega-ohms. And this has very low output impedance. So we use this as a way to buffer something that we're measuring from the thing that's doing the measuring. Let's say you have a transducer out here. If you pull, if you connected it to an ADC that might have a low input impedance of 10K or something like that, you're actually going to drag that voltage around a little bit because you're pulling some current from it. There's some finite resistance of your sensor out here, and you can drag it around. You can affect the system that you're measuring by measuring it. This has almost no input bias current. So we don't affect the system, and it has almost no output impedance, so we can draw quite a bit of power from it, up to the rated power of the device. Does it make sense why we use a buffer for things? When you had, over here on the table the other day, there was a, a little box connected to the, the power supply. I don't know if anybody even really noticed it, but it had the wires coming out of it that we plugged the transducers into, and it had BNC cables coming out of it that we plugged into the voltmeters. That box contained two buffer circuits. 
to buffer the voltmeters, which are relatively high input impedance in this case, from the, uh, the sensors. We won't necessarily need that for a voltmeter most of the time, but in something like the BIAX where we have lots of things that are looking at different signals, you need to buffer things, otherwise you're going to start dragging outputs around. We can make this a little more complicated. This is how everything with op amps goes. Is there something that seems relatively straightforward and you think you're used to it, and then somebody does something else crazy on top of it. Uh, the Art of Electronics, which is a book that Chris and I both have, anybody's welcome to look at them at any time, has a very thick chapter on operational amplifiers and circuits with them. What we're showing you today and the next class are a very small handful of what you can do with it. It just gets incredibly complicated. But we can put a voltage divider in negative feedback. That's how all of electronics works, right? We take building block circuits and we keep stacking them together and stacking them on top of each other to get more complicated behavior. So this voltage divider has two equal value resistors. So we know that the voltage here is going to be half of what we put in here, assuming this end's grounded, right? We put that in the feedback loop, in the negative feedback loop. So if that voltage divider weren't there if it were just connected straight through it to one to one. Now, let's say we put six volts in. We need to have six volts at this terminal, but we have a voltage divider that's cutting the output voltage in half. So the op amp has to put 12 volts on its output to get six volts here and for those to be equal. So the gain of the divider is one, or the gain of the whole circuit, not just the divider, is one, that unity buffer, plus the ratio of R2 and R1. This is a simple way you can create a circuit with pretty much any gain that you want using this technique. Notice though, we're still only having one input, which is this voltage source down here. We'll get to differential inputs next time. So what's the gain on this circuit and what would the output be? Somebody have the gain? Okay, so what's the output voltage? So, so the gain's roughly four and a quarter. So some mental math, it's gonna be a little over 24 volts, right? The other thing that we can do is we can change the same circuit as before. I'll go back so you see there's no, no trickery here. We can change where we're putting before we had the voltage source, our input signal down here. Now let's say we ground that non-inverting input. We put the signal in out here at the end of the voltage divider. What we've just created is an inverting amplifier. Something that takes the signal coming in, inverts it, and amplifies it by now minus R2 over R1. The unity factor's gone because we have this terminal grounded. It's not strictly a voltage follower anymore. So if you have a six volt input, you get a minus six volt output. If you put in a sine wave, you get a sine wave that's 180 degrees out of phase. As you can imagine, it's a little bit easier to find resistors to make the gain you want here, then to find a resistor that makes the gain you want minus one. So that's one reason if you can use two inverting at some point in your circuit, it makes your part selection a lot easier. So if you invert it and do some application, do something else, invert it again and get your output. Sometimes it's easier to do than find those precision resistors. Speaking of precision resistors, we're not gonna go, I'm not gonna do this because we'll just do it verbally right now, it's really quick. This is this standard resistors you can buy that are plus minus 5% tolerance. You can buy plus minus 1, plus minus 0.1, uh, but these are kind of the standard values that you'll find in most bins that we've got around of resistors. So let's say you wanted to make a gain of 100 on this circuit. Uh, you should find things that are a factor of 100 different and pick them, or a gain of 10. So you could have 100 and 200 if you wanted a gain of 
2. Right? So it's pretty easy to find values to do that. You see why if you have to find R2 over R1 plus 1 to be the gain you want, it would be hard to find a combination of these to get you exactly that. You'd have to go to a table of like 1% resistors or 0.1%. So, make sense so far? All right. So this one is a trick question, sort of. What happens if we now use positive feedback? If we take the output and loop it back to the non-inverting input and put our signal in on the inverting input? Always? <laughs> you just guessed, okay. So this is what we call a bistable circuit. This op amp is going to be in one state or it is going to be in the other. If the output is positive, that's going to feed back on itself and it's going to stay positive. If the output were negative, it's going to feed back on itself and the output would stay negative. And you can switch whether the circuit is latched in the positive or negative state. So think about if, let's say we tied this non-inverting input to ground. And at the second that we powered up the circuit, because of cosmic rays, we happen to have a voltage here that was slightly above ground. Do you see how we're going to then, something slightly above ground, minus ground, we get something slightly above ground, loops back around. We're always going to be latched in the positive state. Same thing, if this were slightly below ground, we'd be latched in the negative state. So it's a bistable <coughs> circuit. So, positive feedback does not seem incredibly useful, but it can be. So, we talked about this circuit a little bit ago, where we're squaring a sine wave. Here, we've just adjusted the threshold up a little bit, so we're getting a different duty cycle square wave from a sine wave. Everybody's okay with that. But what happens, this is an ideal situation. What happens if on your signal, there's a little bit of noise, and you get close to that threshold, the noise is bouncing right around the threshold. You could get some weird behavior from your circuit. It could look like this if we exaggerate it. So let's say your noise is bad. As you get close to the threshold, you're going to get some jitter in the square wave, and that's probably not what you want. So what we can do is use positive feedback to introduce hysteresis into the circuit with a resistor. You can look up the formula for this to introduce some of that hysteresis. The way that this is going to work, so that resistor is going to put some bias on this signal based on what the output is. We can drag this signal up or drag this signal down a little bit based on whether we have a high or low output here. So what that looks like is let's say that this center line is what we have our threshold set to. Well, depending on the, by, the output, we're going to actually be shifting that up or down slightly. So let's say that we're on the upcoming side of the square wave. This is going to be biasing, oops. this is going to be biasing that upward, because we've got a positive voltage on the output. So our threshold's really going to be up here at this top green line. When we reach that, boom, the output goes negative. The output now, is negative and it's down biasing the, from that voltage divider. So now this is our threshold. So the threshold jumps. So now this noise up here doesn't matter. This is our new threshold. We get down here, we meet it, bang, signal changes, thresholds back up here. So it's a way of moving the threshold based on the output state, providing a little bit of a, well, it's hysteresis into the mechanism. People sort of see how that works. I mean, I'm not going to do the formulas. You can, if you really want to go, you can knock yourself out doing the resistor network calculation. It's not that hard. Or you can look it up. But it's a really useful technique and something that we do because you don't want a lot of jitter generally when you're approaching some kind of comparison threshold. Uh, for example, this is how the failsafe mechanisms on the biax latch. They have hysteresis in the loop. You can even use this and create an oscillator. This is something that's kind of handy. We're using this, this bistable condition. Uh, we have the output 
going back through an RC circuit. So we're charging and discharging this capacitor through this resistor. And let's see, so we've got two voltage points in here, VRAMP and VREF. So let's say that VREF is high, so the output's high. We're going to start charging the capacitor, this black curve, some kind of RC curve. Once that reaches where the, uh, the voltage on this RC circuit, once it reaches the REF voltage, the output of this is going to flip. It's going to go down. We're going to start discharging that capacitor through that resistor. So we charge and discharge alternately and can create an oscillator with the circuit. Another use for op amps. Uh, there are other circuits like 555 timers and other things people use to do this as well. And I'm kind of rushing through this because I want to be able to get us up to the lab. Uh, but one of the other useful circuits is a constant current source or a variable current source where you can set the current. Uh, a lot of times if you have a signal that's running over some long distance, the voltage drop in the wire can be significant. Wire is not infinitely conductive. It's fraction of an ohm a foot generally. So if you have to signal over a long distance, it's better to use current to do the signaling instead of voltage. There's no reason we can't do that, right? The industry standard for a lot of sensors is 4 to 20 milliamps current. And the sensor output voltage, let's say in this case, is 1 to 5 volts. We can use this circuit to create that constant current output. We've got a 250 ohm resistor here. If you do the math from Ohm's law, you'll see at 5 volts, there's 20 milliamps flowing through that. At 1 volt, there's 4 milliamps flowing through that 250 ohm resistor. And basically, it's just in the loop. We know the current everywhere in the loop has to be the same. So what the op amp is doing is putting out whatever voltage it needs to to hold the current at that 4 to 20 milliamp range. So we're signaling with current, not voltage. The voltage could be higher based on how much drop you've got in the wire. Good so far? I don't think we have anything in the lab that's a constant current signaler that I know of. But you do see this quite a bit in industrial applications. And you can buy sensors like from Omega when you're buying pressure transducers, let's say. You can buy uh, minus 10 to 10, 0 to 5 volt transducers, or you can buy 4 to 20 milliamp. And they have a circuit like this inside that's making a current source. Uh, one of the specs that you'll see on data sheets is common mode rejection ratio, CMRR. Uh, you want a very high common mode rejection ratio because this is one of those nasty things about op, op amps not being ideal. Let's say that you have 1.55 volts and 1.55 volts. What should the output be? Forget feedback for now, but... We have 1.55 minus 1.55 should be zero. It's not going to be ever because the common mode, both of these are 1.55, is going to have some effect on the output. So 1.55 or 6.6, .6, they're going to give you some slightly different voltage on the output because it's failing at rejecting the thing that's common to both of these signals. Uh, most of the common order rejection ratios are very high, you know, like 90 dB or something. But something to watch out for. You want to try to keep the common mode down if you can by, say, AC coupling a signal instead of DC. Uh, input offset voltage is something else that real op amps have. Uh, for example, it's sort of like having a voltage source on one of the lines just from things aren't quite trimmed perfectly in the real world. These have laser trimmed resistors inside that try to match everything as closely as possible, but you're never going to get everything quite the same. So there's always going to be a slight offset on the input of the two terminals. That's not ideal. This is where, remember, the second or third slide, we had those two terminals that we didn't talk about that were the offset null terminals. You can use a potentiometer with generally the minus rail feeding into the wiper to offset that. This is an adjustment on the op amp that if you really need things to be exactly nulled, you go in there with your little fine non-magnetic screwdriver and you get the proper tongue angle and you tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak until it's exactly nulled. It's a way to compensate for the manufacturing differences in the chips. 
I would say we don't commonly do that. This is a trap that a lot of people will fall into at some point. Uh, let's say we have a thermocouple that is generating some current because we have a difference in temperature, right? We talked about thermocouples and how they work a couple lectures ago. Uh, if you feed that into this circuit, where can the current go? We have effectively infinite input impedance here. So there's going to be no current flow and you're going to get very erratic behavior. You need to provide a current path always for the input bias current. It's nanoamps, probably, probably nanoamps, maybe picoamps in some cases, but you have to provide a ground path for it. So if you get really weird behavior, make sure that the input bias current has a ground path to your circuit. Uh, you also can get some voltage drops that you might not think of. There's some resistance in the wire, in the trace, and the whatever from your input into the operational amplifier. And there's some resistance inside. Because you have a little bit of current flowing and there's a little bit of resistance, you're going to get a little bit of voltage drop from Ohm's law. So you can get a little bit of air introduced from input bias current, introducing some voltage drops. Like everything that's a semiconductor, op amps are subject to temperature drift. In this case, it's a plot of open loop gain versus temperature. You can see it varies by about a factor of four over minus 55 to 125 C. So not horrible. Generally, it won't catch you off guard, but something to be aware of. All the data sheets have plots like this in them. And the last thing before we go upstairs is the frequency response. This is a plot of the amplitude and phase response of an operational amplifier to an input signal. And as you can see, it's not flat at all. Uh, what this means, if we take some oscilloscope shots of this, we have the input and the output from the circuit. So we're taking the sine wave, we're amplifying it. Here, we're at a relatively low frequency. Don't know if we can can't really read it. It's about two kilohertz, it looks like, though. So everything's going fine there. We're in phase, and we're doing the right amplification. As we start increasing the frequency, we start getting a little bit of a phase shift, and the amplification starts changing. The gain is changing until we actually are now smaller than our input signal, and we're significantly phase shifted, about 45 degrees in this case. So that can be a problem, especially if you're doing some kind of control circuit. Uh, say you're controlling a hydraulic system, something that we do a lot in high pressure experimental work. Uh, phase shifts can translate to instabilities in the system, hydraulics just continually oscillating, things like that. So you want to make sure that you know what the frequency response of the circuit's going to be, and probably that you measure it. Uh, I generally try to do that. Hook it up to a, a frequency generator, a function generator. We've got one in the lab sweep through a range of frequencies and just watch what the output of the circuit is. Make sure that you know what's going on. So the only assignment is your projects. Uh, we have six lectures after this until your project presentations because that's how long there is until the end of the semester. There's a week in there for Thanksgiving, but we're over halfway through the semester now. So make sure that you're starting to work on them. Uh, if you don't have all of your materials, and haven't talked to me about it. I know there's some people that had some things that were long shipping dates. Uh, so when they come, I'll bring them to you. Uh, if you need to find something quicker, maybe consider looking online, see if you can find something that will ship faster. When we go upstairs, I can pull up the shipping dates for your stuff if it's not here. Uh, so keep working on those. Come talk to us if you have issues. OK, anything from? The lecture, anything about projects, anything else we need to talk about down here before we go upstairs and let you keep working on and help you with your strain gauge circuits. You're going to need your strain gauge circuits next Thursday because we're going to build an amplifier and hook them up to it. So they need to work. <laughs> yeah. If we need to get things over at the machine shop, what's the relative timeline that we should expect for that? Uh, the last time I got parts made there, it was about 10 days to two weeks. Yeah. So if you want to check out your week's 
Sharon, could you get the projector? Other one. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. about the positive feedback. Mm -hmm. If we got a noise like this, we've mm -hmm. got a positive one first. So if we got a positive feedback, they will always go like this, but not this. Oh. Uh, yeah, so you. You have to limit the positive feedback a little yeah, bit. So I have yeah, just keep it positive. But right. If the noise go down first, then then go up. I would never know what is the. Reason. Yeah, it wouldn't switch until there. And would that matter if I'm doing an experiment? Depends on the application, really. A lot of times, probably not, because okay. that that would be. Really small. It would be really small, depending on the time base. Generally, when you're doing something like this, it's a kilohertz, so that might be. Microsecond. Most of the time, it won't matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very yeah, much. no problem. Uh, yes, I will. I need to bring them in at night when I can drive my car up here. Okay. So, I'll try to bring it tonight. Cool. Yeah, it's hard to get on the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I don't remember how much you ordered, but there are several people that ordered, like Ben, and I think maybe yours too ordered some length and they either weren't available in that length or it was as cheap to get it 